Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, katoa, uh, kia ora. Uh, my name's Ollie Hill and I'm the country manager for HP New Zealand. Uh, delighted to be here with you today. I want to start off by thanking Bongaburra College for inviting us here to be part of this amazing journey. Um, it's really fantastic to hear sort of the, where, you, where you were going and we're delighted to be able to help you um, down that path. Um, I'm also joined today by Brett Salakis, who is our HP um, Education Ambassador. So Brett is the force behind Reinvent the Classroom, and I don't use the word force lightly. Because um, I was a tight head number three, so... <laughs> also, if you've seen him on LinkedIn, uh, he's full noise. So um, uh, yeah, we're delighted to have Brett as part of our organisation, someone who is an educator, who understands the space and can make sure that HP is adding. Uh, value in, in the right way. So before Brett sort of talks a little bit around reinvent the classroom and, and what we're delivering, I want to talk a little bit about HP and, and why we're here and what we're doing. So hopefully most of you have heard of HP. Good, okay. Uh, so HP was founded uh, in 1939 by two gentlemen by the name of Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard in a one-car garage um, in San Francisco which is now considered the birthplace of Silicon Valley. So Bill and Dave were an amazing pair and combination. They obviously created an enormous organisation that really put technology in the hands of everyday people. They enabled governments, businesses, schools, uh, consumers to really get access to that technology. But the main thing that Bill and Dave have done for us is set an amazing foundation. Because they believed that the sole purpose of a company was not to make a profit. They believed that businesses should be there for the betterment of society. And they, they put that into action. And we've been delighted to keep living that HP way um, over you know, uh, almost nine decades now. And so we've built on that foundation. And one of the, the key things that we've made is, is, is a pledge to be the world's most just um, and sustainable technology company by 2030. So that sounds good, but obviously it's easy to say. What we've done is we've also set some really ambitious targets. So, you know, we're a company that makes a lot of stuff, right? Um, and so one of the things that we have to do is make sure we're reducing our carbon footprint. And we've set some really ambitious goals. Uh, Ten years ahead of uh, the Paris Accord, we're going to be carbon neutral by 2040. Um, and halving our emissions by 2030. But also, the just bit is really important to us, and this is where education comes in. So we're really committed to bridging that digital divide. Uh, so we've committed to um, bridging the digital divide to 100 million people by 2025, and I'm delighted to say we are well on track to meet um, that target. So. That's a bit about HP, it's why we're here, it's why we've done Reinvent the Classroom, we believe in this. For me, um, from a technology standpoint, I see this as a great enabler. The ability for technology to lift our tamariki and our entire country up is huge. My daughter uh, is seven, she was six last year when I started teaching her how to code. Now, I've never actually let her use a computer or smart device before, but I sat down and, and uh, don't get me wrong, I don't know how to code, so if you want anything coded, don't ask me. Uh, ask ChatGPT. <laughs> that's right. But, you know, ChatGPT is a great example, is I want her to grow up with technology as a language that she understands, so that when she decides the thing she wants to do, the problem in this world she wants to solve, she has the skills to look at it and go, this is the way that technology can solve that problem. And that's what I want for my daughter, and that's what I want for all New Zealand children, is to be able to lift them up. And that's why I'm so delighted that we have this program, um, and that you know, we have amazing schools like Whangaparoa uh, coming on that journey with us. So, thank you, Brett. Uh, and no worries, you, no and worries. And you can um, take the with the classroom. All goody, with the non-teacher. Give, give all your class. <laughs> Not 
Tom Teacher can uh, go without a microphone. I, I think the big unit can as well. Uh, I'm a primary school teacher, uh, and we all know that primary school teachers make the best teachers. That's right. Yeah. You, know, you know who the best high school teachers are, though, don't you, Steve? Yes. Uh, former primary school teachers. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about reinvent the classroom. In fact, we're going to talk about two things today. Uh, we're going to talk one about what is reinvent the classroom, and, and the teachers from from the prior uh, have already got a taste of that because we did that big data collection that, that, that Christian uh, was talking about, and all the things that stem from that. We're going to unpack that, and that won't take long, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. But we're also going to have a lot of fun. Today is all about getting really, really practical, getting hands on, and <coughs> some of us. I've, I've, I've been feeling my phone buzzing in my, my pocket, I've been trying to uh, ignore it, but I'm going to ask you all to take your phones out. Uh, I'm gonna, if you've got your laptop, open up your laptop. No one's allowed to sit hands in uh, pockets, uh, or, or hands in lap. I want everyone's phone up, and uh, Mike, do you want to come up with me as well? Because I'm going to flip the presentation. I think we've been spoken to a little bit, and we're going to do some, some practical, hands-on hands -on things right now. So, uh, I will talk about what reinvent the classroom is at the ending of this, and we might get a, a little bit of fun. Uh, Mike, do you want to introduce yourself uh, as we bring up the, the next slide? Yep. Yeah, let's go. Excellent. So, Mike, uh, good to see you uh, here, some familiar faces. Uh, from Using Technology Better, so we've been on a bit of a journey with Connor Crow College for a while now. Can you um, hear him? I know he's a bit soft. Is he's, he's all right? Do you want to phone? Well, I, I, I know we're going to do a little bit of an ed tech battle here, and you're already letting down the team. Um, so just, there'll be some sort of comparison in the ending. Yeah, get a mic. Uh, just already. Oh, see, he's so soft. It's already soft. One of us is full of hair. One of us is bringing all of his Australian arrogance to the, to the thing. All right. So, uh, we're going to have a bit of an EdTech battle, and uh, Brett and I are going to talk over each other, basically. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, using technology better, we've been on a bit of a journey with Fonger Pro College, and uh, really this partnership came out of conversations with the senior leadership team about all the potential and all the possibilities and all the things you could do, but if you don't have really good data, it's hard to know where to go next, right? And so, that's one of the things we've really appreciated about what HP are able to do with their AI behind uh, the scenes and the, and the format that we're going to go for. So we're going to start talking about a range of different tools and uh, you guys are going to vote on which tool you think is the best and also, more importantly, which presenter is better. Well, that's pretty easy. That, that's going to be a no-brainer. But uh, look, the, the, the whole point of reinvent the classroom, whilst we might get hardware into schools and we've got all the infrastructure and the MOE looks after making sure we've got good Wi-Fi because, of course, there's no impeccable Wi-Fi at every school, right? There's, ne there's never any dropouts, never any issues. But the real, the real transformation thing is when teachers are using technology effectively in a way that our students then are, are, are the big winners. Their students learn more effectively because of the tech we're using. That is actually at the heart and soul of what reinvent the classroom is all about. We'll collect some data, we'll talk to the leadership team, we'll make a plan, we'll use great trainers, and we'll actually upskill the, the, the teachers so that we can really enrich our, enrich our programs right now, in the next like half an hour or so, we're going to battle and we're going to look at a whole bunch of different tools that you can learn right now and maybe even use literally tomorrow in your classrooms. So take note. Let's go first. I think we're going to talk about VR first. Yeah, we're going to talk about VR. Yeah. And Mike's going to kick this off because, you know, Australians are known for our politeness. Uh, I'm going to let you go first. <laughs> All right. So. VR is one of those interesting things. We've got this battle between AR, augmented reality, VR, virtual reality. Uh, I think where we're going to start to see, this is my prediction, uh, maybe HP wants something to differently, but we're going to start moving more and more towards the AR, the augmented reality, more so than the VR, which is a virtual reality where you uh, basically you exclude the world and then you uh, immerse yourself in that technology, but the world disappears. Where we get really nice interaction is where we can layer uh, technology into the world that we've got. But talking about VR specifically, here is uh, some information around what uh, people are doing now with virtual reality art. Now one of our things that we always uh, believe in and using technology better is that it, VR shouldn't be something that you just consume, it should be something that you create. And so we always want to start with a blank canvas 
and then from that blank canvas we can build it out and we can have the students creating, not just sitting there like a bunch of zombies just consuming information. That doesn't really help anybody. So have a quick look at this video. I won't play all of it, but this is where we're at with the technology that we've got now uh, available to us. So we've got artists who are creating 3D installations that you can literally walk through and look at from different angles and uh, different ways of being able to interact with that medium. some of the team and we ran a bit of a Minecraft challenge with the students and so you'll be able to experience that in the experience room uh, just afterwards. But uh, one of the things that you're able to do is we can start to create and build worlds. Let me just show you a little bit of what happened on the day. So they've got challenges that they need to do. It's all about sustainability and travel. So everyone's seen Minecraft, right? You can create worlds, uh, they're quite interactive, students get right into it. But where the opportunity comes at the end of this is for your students to be able to take what they've created in that world, which is a 3D world but in a 2D experience, and to be able to export those uh, things that they've created, and then they can print them in 3D printers, they can put them into VR worlds. And uh, I'll show you an example later on, but you can actually start to walk through and look at scale and proportion uh, and things like that in the world that you've actually created, uh, which, is, uh, which is a really nice thing to be able to do. So again, it's taking the learning and it's making much more experiential uh, down the track. So I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. Brett, obviously you've got nothing to say. Let's just keep going. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, I'll go, I'll go. Let's, uh, let's get phones up. Let's get phones up. Oh. Okay, 
So let's have a look. If you've got, if you've got your phone, can you scan that QR code for me? Uh, if you're having trouble scanning the QR code, just go to salakas.me slash Uluru. Love seeing all the tech get put up at once. And all the people are going, oh, why did I leave my phone in my classroom? So if you hit enter VR at the top, have a, have a little bit of a look around. This is how fast, uh, VR does not have to be wild and super expensive and, and, and crazy difficult to do. Imagine taking your students to just about anywhere in the world. This is uh, a, a, an online free tool, 360 cities. There are 360 degree images of just about every single location in the entire planet. You go to the website, you're doing, you're doing French, you're doing the French Revolution, you're talking about, uh, hey, look at this, love the buzz. I didn't hear any buzz when, when reading was presenting. I uh, love this. But, uh, so imagine you're doing ancient history, take your students straight away to the Colosseum. Let them move around, let them explore, let them have that buzz. You've got them engaged, you've got them hooked, and then you go, yes, question. Oh, no. Well, that might be your Wi-Fi, and that's not that's not that's not me. Uh, so you might have to you might have to talk to someone who runs the Wi-Fi. There's a there's a guy up here who's responsible. So all questions are about Wi-Fi directed here. There you go. Second question, second tool I want to show you. So that was 360 cities. It's awesome, super easy. Grab the link that you want. Make a QR code. Go there. This is one of my favorite tools, Situ 360. In Situ 360, you as the educator and your students, more importantly, get to craft their own virtual reality experience. This particular one that I've got here was actually a, an entire term's worth of work that I created. There was explicit learning at the beginning, uh, four weeks of explicit instruction, actually embedded videos. It's basically when you go on Google Maps and you actually pick a series of 360 degree images you tether them together, uh, you put up little portals in there so you can embed your Google Doc, you can embed your, uh, your, your Microsoft Doc if, you, if you're a Microsoft platform user, you can have portals off to uh, YouTube clips, you can have text floating in there that's instructions, you can embed audio in the, into the background so that, so that you can have your students, your voice instructing the students and then they can go through and actually be walked through the entire thing. And what's really cool is after you, instead of you presenting that, how about we allow our students the ability to do their own research project and instead of maybe doing a, 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 an information report about volcanoes or an information report about the North Island, how about we collect a bunch of uh, 360 degree images or maybe even you go on an excursion and you take a 360 degree camera and you get some 360 uh, images, stitch them together and they actually will embed their, what they've learned in there. So you have created a completely immersive learning environment either from you as the teacher or from your students creating immersive environments. And I think I'm already winning. <laughs> so, what I might do now, oh, Merge Cube. Has anyone seen these? Anyone used one? Anyone want one? Catch! Alright, does anyone want another one? Alright, well, you've got to tell me what they are. Do you know what they do? Spot on. Okay, so these are a little bit more in line with AR. So this is augmented reality. Whoa, that's a bad throw. That's why I didn't play cricket. See, Aussie's very good at underarm bowling, you see. Uh, if you don't get that joke, maybe ask someone a little bit older. Uh, <laughs> Look, yeah, so these actually have augmented reality triggers all around them. So last time I used one of these uh, in a classroom, or one, the last time I saw one of these in a classroom, was actually an English high school uh, novel study, an actual novel study done with an augmented reality. So we use co-spaces. Uh, you may already have co-spaces in your school. Lots of schools have co-spaces licenses. You have co-spaces. There is a Merge Cube uh, add-on that you can use with this, so the students can actually create a virtual scene. Uh, they embed their text, they embed lots of even animated things, moving and moving, moving. You have six different ones, you set the task, one's like your, your main character, one's the key quotes, one's the themes of the book. The children can actually create an entire six-part analysis of whatever you want, 
in a completely augmented uh, uh, scene. So before they even know that they're doing hard research and, and deep learning, you've got them hooked and they're already doing it. And I am sure now I am smashing it compared uh, to you, brother. So uh, let's have our first vote. So if I can have everyone using your phones, can you please go to, up the top there, you'll see menti.com, www, or just go menti.com, and then you're going to be asked to use the code 37373127, and we're going to vote live right now. So this will be a live poll, so I need you voting. We need the, the, the interaction from the audience. Uh, and let's have a look. We're going to rank these platforms in the order that you are most likely to use. And we we'll, should be able to see if our Wi-Fi works. Uh, we should be able to see in real time. Uh, these go. Once you start entering them. And I might just refresh to make sure that there we are. Ah, oh, 360 cities and Merge Cube. Oh, oh, look at that. Look at that. One, two, three, and four. Oh, no. All right. Uh, one, two, three, five is me. Situ 360, rising. Uh, look at you, fourth and sixth. How's it feel, reading? That's all right. There you go. Oh, Situ 360, climbing. Minecraft VR climbing. That's because I'm dishing you too much and now people are feeling sympathetic. <laughs> but look, here we go. Again, a, a pretty simple rule, a pretty simple way to be able to engage uh, with, your, with, with your students. Menti does have a, a free service. You get to ask uh, a couple of questions for free. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, if you want to ask more uh, than, than two or so questions in, in a classroom, you do have to have a subscription model. But you can ask a couple of questions per class uh, with, without getting into to, too much cost. Well, at zero cost. All right, and it looks like 360 Cities is the winner. Well done. Give a round of applause for 360 Cities. Explain to everybody what Big Journey is. Yeah, it's a uh, artificial intelligent um, tool to render visual art. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So good. So there's a lot of generative AI. That's the term uh, that we probably need to talk about. So when we talk about AI and, and what's going to be in school, we're talking about generative AI. So uh, Chat GPT is the is the tool that you've probably heard a lot about. Although generative AI has been out for for quite some time. If you have a look here over in the right, I actually made a, uh, Ollie mentioned I've got some good uh, social media game, so I made a little bit of an infographic a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago about a few different ways that we do have uh, generative AI, a few different tools. So when I did a, a little Google, probably early January, there were about 500 uh, generative AI companies uh, doing things that has recently absolutely exploded. So we have image generation. Uh, and that's when we had our mid-journey. I'm going to show you one called DALI 2 in a moment. Uh, you've got video generation where you've got Pictory, Flicky, Synthesia, where you actually can put in text, put in prompts, and video will generate based on what you've, what you've been able to put. We've got audio generator, so voice maker. Uh, these are great accessibility tools if you have someone who is uh, foreign language, new arrival, super shy. Uh, or, or any other reason can't fully uh, participate within a, a classroom presentation. So when we talk accessibility for a child who might have really high anxiety and might not be able to do an oral presentation in class, suddenly we can use these voice generation. You can actually submit their work. Uh, they, uh, a voice will be able to read their work and they can submit oral presentations and activate in class. So we actually are far more inclusive by being able to use these AI sort of tools. We have the text generation which is our chat GPT and, and, and some of the other things uh, that we've been able to, a, able to talk about. So uh, generative AI generates new content, original content. Uh, and uh, what can we do with it? The best way that I have currently seen uh, chat GPT used 
was uh, with some teachers not so long ago. We actually got a, a year rate uh, piece of work. Uh, we looked at a couple of different uh, writing samples. It was all about uh, uh, natural forces. So we had earthquakes, volcanoes and whatnot. Year eight, uh, grab the year eight report about earthquakes. Actually, I think the one that we did the demonstration was, was on volcanoes. Uh, gave that to the gave that to the um, the chat GPT. Also put in the marking rubric that we had. So we know as educators, we know as educators that feedback is one of the most effective things that we can do with our students. One of the most effective ways that we can move the needle and improve our students' performance is giving good, adequate feedback. Chat GPT can give you uh, tools that you've never been able to utilise before. So imagine being able to get your students' written work, put in your marking rubric, ask ChatGPT, can you help assess this student's piece of work? It'll give you recommendations on what band in the rubric they'll be. I tried to push it to get an actual score. It wouldn't let me ha have an actual score. It just kept recommending what band, and, I, and then I got to pick. Then uh, we asked the ChatGPT, could you give me a one paragraph summary of how that student performed against the rubric? It wrote that for me, like within a few seconds. Then I asked ChatGPT, could you please give me five ways that that student could improve their piece of work, improve their writing, and give me examples of what the student could have done to have done a better job in their written report. And it does that instantly. That's super cool. However, yes? Sorry? Absolutely we need teachers because humans need contact. ChatGPT is not going to help the student understand what's there. Imagine if you just email the kid a whole big bulk of text and didn't have anyone to sit next to them and unpack what that meant. We need that human content. Of course, these tools give us the ability to give detailed feedback, to give that human content. We need the humanity in our learning. We are not robots. We absolutely need the, the teacher there. But imagine a superpower teacher that can draw on new information that uh, normally would take an hour to be able to give that sort of content to a feedback to a child. We can do that within about, within about one minute and then we can sit down and give them such direct feedback. And we finished by actually asking GTP to rewrite the student's original piece of work with those five improvement recommendations. So not only did the child have all of those suggestions, they actually saw what their work could look like if they were doing it at that, that higher level. So it's very, very powerful stuff. You've got a few things you want to say about? Like I said, hot air. Um, so, broad versus narrow AI. We also need to understand the difference between broad AI and narrow AI. Broad AI is Robocop, where an artificial intelligence bot, robot, walks down the street, understands language, understands actions, understands moods, and can interact, can make decisions, ask uh, it a question, you can answer it. Uh, we're not there yet, thankfully, because some of us are still trying to get our heads around ChatGPT. Uh, if you were greeted by that, that would be a little bit of a shock. What we do have is narrow AI, where you can train the AI in a set of data, and it will learn from that data, and then it can answer questions on that. So I'm going to show you an example in a minute of a, a digital teacher where they have trained it all about um, uh, environmental science and, and so on. So if you ask it any question on environmental science, it can ask, answer it. But you ask it a question about any other topic, and it will just say, sorry, I don't understand. So if it was to understand all topics about all things, that would be broad. But really where we're at is the narrow. But what's happening is we're starting to see that shift now with ChatGPT and that type of AI where it's learning from large data sets now and you can ask it a question about anything and it starts to come back with answers. Right? So we're moving towards that broad AI but we're still sitting inside that narrow AI uh, band. So um, Brett's talked to you a little bit about ChatGPT and I want to just give you an example of the sort of thing that we can do here. So you can see that I've asked ChatGPT uh, to create a lesson plan uh, for discussing Maori traditions in, and link it to the Year 10 Histories curriculum specifically in New Zealand. So I'm going to jump out of here and just show you live what that looks like uh, over here. Let me just grab this one. Not that one. All right, so I've got chat GPT open. I type the question in, and so here comes the lesson plan. It's going to last for one hour, 
and it's going to give me the objectives, it's going to give me the materials that I'm going to need, it's going to give me the introduction, everything that I need for that lesson plan, it's writing it out for me uh, straight away. Now because this is uh, able to be discussed, what you can do is, as a teacher, this is where you need to come with your professionalism and your knowledge of the content and where you want to take the students on that learning journey, and you can start to narrow down that particular question and you can start to refine it. So I could say, well actually I only want that to be 40 minutes and you can say, give me a 40 minute lesson and we'll rewrite it for you. But I can also say here, uh, afterwards where it talks about the assessment side of things, maybe I want to do uh, 10 quick quizzes, 10 quick questions to understand uh, knowledge. So I could say, Right. So I'm just going to say create 10 quick questions and it's just going to go write those questions for me in there. Now notice it's not giving me the answers right now. So let's just say that I really want to work on it. So let's just stop this generating for now. And I'll say... What's the answers? Um, so it gives you the answers to the questions. <laughs> uh, so it's understanding context, so you can drill deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Uh, you can ask it to create, is the next step that's about to get released with ChatGTP4, you can say, now go create me a PowerPoint that supports this lesson, and boom, it will go and create the PowerPoint ready for you to go. Question, comment. Can you export those questions to Google Docs or anything like that? Yeah, 100%. So you can take those questions, chuck them straight into a Google Doc, and then the, the, you can have the self-marking section ready to go. Yep? So what's the um, scenario around this property? Essentially what the chat is doing is mining everything that's on the internet. Yep. Um, so, and in terms of uh, copyright and things like that. Yep. Great question. Perfect segue. It's almost like you've looked at the slide deck. So, chat GPT, you can keep asking questions, it can keep producing it for you. But notice it doesn't um, cite any references and things like that. So you might have heard that Microsoft went and bought uh, or paid or invested into ChatGPT and it's now in Bing. So I've opened up Bing, in case you've never heard of it, it's like Google, uh, and I've asked exactly the same question in here. And see over the side here, it's um, responding over here. So it's searching for these Maori traditions. Waiting, 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 hopefully it's not blocked. What it will do is it will take its chat GPT, so it's going to give me exactly, here we go, um, here, exactly what um, it was giving me before, but notice now that it's starting to cite references as it comes in. Okay, so what we're doing now is we're taking that same tool, sits inside Bing, it goes out and searches the internet, and uh, it will start to uh, reference and cite those resources for me uh, just in here. And again, I, once it's finished with that, I can then ask it more questions, I can ask it to create quizzes for me, and so on. So in ChatGPT Natural, you get all the information you want, copy and paste, do what you like, and then in Bing, it will take it to the next level and it will give you the extra bits that, you, uh, that you're looking for. So, any other quick questions on that before we move on? I know it's a lot of information to take in. One of the questions we get asked all the time is what about, uh, what does ChatGP2 uh, do with the data? So Brett, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, look, I, I actually want to show you an AI tool that is literally maybe about 36 hours old. Uh, it's been uh, built on GPT-3, which is the language model that also ChatGPT is built on. Uh, there are definite reasons, and I'm actually going to unpack in a moment, one of the real reasons why we do need to move very cautiously forward. Uh, with AI. I, I think there are huge benefits to incorporating this, particularly around uh, a, a relief of administration on, on teachers' shoulders to be able to utilise AI, but there are some concerns. One of the concerns is, is, is privacy, student data. One of the reasons why uh, GPT, uh, chat GPT is free is because uh, I remember when I was a, I'll use a little anecdote, I remember when I was a, a young teacher at, uh, at, at university, the, the, the science lecturer, he, he taught me a word, tarn stuffle. Tarn stuffle. Has anyone heard of tarn stuffle? Probably not. 
Tarn Stuffle uh, acronym stands for there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. If you're getting something for free, it's because you're probably the product. Uh, so we have been the product. We are be helping to train that AI for open AI. We've been helping to fine tune their product as they're getting ready to be able to market it to us and, and, and sell it as a service and all that sort of stuff. This is built on GPT-3 language model. It's called Byte, it's from Codebreaker. It has no actual login. So one of the problems for schools and ministry or all that sort of stuff is that right now, in terms of service for ChatGPT, because you need a login and it collects information, is that up until about three weeks ago, you were meant to be over 18 before you could use it. Uh, about two, three weeks ago, they changed the terms of service to 13 plus with parental or, or school permission that students would be able to use it because it is about, it is logging on. You've got your logon details, you've got your email, uh, you, you, you actually use your phone number to set up an account, you, you've got your phone number in there, uh, and it remembers all the questions you're asking it because you're training, you're continuing to train the, the, the model. Remember, Tarn stuff for you are the actual product. So this is not great moving forward with, with, with student data. So a tool like this, but actually has no login, uses the same language model, you get to be able to have the same sort of responses, you get to actually have your students get prompts, you get prompts, but you don't have to worry about that, that transfer of your, of, of your private data. Yep. What you have to create your own for work? Now, do you know what? One of the best questions you can ask, because the very, very first time I saw uh, ChatGPT, right, at, keep in mind, it launched, well, depending on what country you were in, uh, it launched either the last day of December or the first day of, uh, last day of November or the first day of December last year. It was the fastest, the, the fastest uh, online tool to reach one, one million users in the entire world. It took five days for it to have one million users. It had a hundred million within a, a couple of days after that. So students are using it, people are using it all around the world. The very, very first thing I did was, uh, go, I'm, I'm in, from New South Wales in Sydney, uh, I grabbed the, the year 12 final exam uh, for history. Uh, they had an essay question there for, for modern history. It was uh, write an essay about uh, the impact of Japanese uh, culture on during uh, American occupation of post-World War II Japan. It, I asked ChatGPT to write a, a 1500 word essay for me. It did it in about 45 seconds. Okay, so my challenge right now, and this is not going to be the answer you want, but my challenge right now is if we have an issue with assessment and AI, we actually likely have an issue with our assessment policy and the way we're doing assessment rather than a technology policy. Because we have known for a long, long time what good quality assessment is. We know through Bloom's taxonomy that we want creative, evaluative thinking. We know that tools like this will spout things back but not reference, uh, not reference other material, not reference uh, case studies, not reference personal experiences. So we actually need to use these types of tools as a reference, but then see what they're doing poorly and build, build on them. I don't want to get stuck on the assessment one, but I'm very, very happy to keep diving into that because I'm a massive nerd about this sort of stuff and I can talk all night. Can we jump to the next slide for me? Yes, all right, and I'm going to hand over to Holy Sheet. Which is what some of you might be thinking right now, right? I'll, I'll talk to you after, okay. Yeah. So, uh, I want to just show you, uh, AI now is in Google Docs, it's also in Excel, inside the Microsoft products as well. So here we've got an example of a teacher, so I've shown you, creating lesson plans, uh, surveys, that sort of thing. Uh, we've got some students in here with some fake data, don't panic. Uh, and so we've got some tests in here, we've got some averages. And then I've also got some information in here about their attitude, their homework, their behaviour and so on. So I'm just taking notes as we go throughout the term or the semester and uh, just taking some, uh, some ideas. So basically I've got, uh, like in terms of their attitude, are they engaged, attentive, passive? I can choose whatever I like out of here. It's just smart chips inside um, Sheets. Uh, it's also inside your Google Docs and so on. Uh, and then I'm not going to get into it right now, but I've got a uh, summary that just pulls all the data together. And there is an add-on in here in terms of our extensions that we can add on, and it's called numerous.ai. Numerous.ai. And so what I can do with numerous.ai is I can click and say show the sidebar over here, 
and I can ask it to write a function for me using ChatGPT. And so in here, it tells you the formula that you've got to use to write it. So what I've done is I just went in here and I said write, let me just get rid of this, in here, for instance, write uh, this. So I said write a report for A3, which is a student, that uses, well, I didn't even use the right spelling, it still knew what I wanted, um, less than, that's meant to be, that is less than 100 words uh, that has a positive tone but highlights the areas for improvement. Right? And then I just hit enter, about five seconds later, my report is written for that particular student that is pulling from all the data that I've created across the uh, term and it's written it for me. What I can do is I can just grab that, drag it down, and it's going to instantly, oh, if I rerun the extension, this is a new sheet, it would pick that extension up, rerun it for me, all the reports are written for the student right there and then. That's the so, winner! That's the winner! <laughs> right there. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So these sort of tools are now coming in. Now you can say, well, I should write every little word of that so I can make sure that I put my heart and soul into it. You'll say that for about the first five. Don't lie to me. And then you start doing the control C, control V thing anyway. So why not have AI take the data and write something that's personalized to the student? Of course, you still run your eye over it, change it how you like, but that's your reports written right there. So all it takes for you is to set up the sheet, which is quite easy to do, start to get the data into it as the term starts to go through, and you'll have that information there. All right, I'll give you, you've got one winner. You've got oh, right. one right. winner. Right. Even a broken watch is right away. <laughs> right away. Salakis. All right. Okay, here's another one. Yeah, all good, all good. Oh, look, I'm going to be, I'm, yeah, we, we're good, we're good. Uh, could I ask everyone just to, to stand up for a moment? I'm a primary school teacher. We're going to be a little bit interactive. Uh, we all know how to play scissors, paper, rock, right? So can you please play scissors, paper, rock with the person next to you? If you win, keep standing. If you lose, sit down. Scissors, paper, rock, you've got to play. If you win, keep standing. If you lose, sit down. Don't play best out of three, just play one. Don't play best out of three. If you're standing, find another person near you standing and keep the game going.
There's the old teacher skills. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you. Can you just type in here for me? So this tool is called Dali. It's actually Dali 2. It is an image generation AI tool. So it will create images. What we create has not existed. It's not doing a Google search for images. It will create within just a few seconds uh, something that has not existed beforehand. So uh, if I'm going to, we had, where's our, Davina English, what, what grade? Uh, 8 to 13. Eight to 13. Um, we're doing narratives or something like that at the moment. What are we? What are we? What are we doing? Give me a grade. What? what uh, a writing type, a writing genre. Oh, okay. What are we studying? Anything in particular topic? Communication. communication. Oh, funny enough, communication technology. So if I was going to write something about a communication technology, maybe I'm going to weave in something. What sort of character or what sort of item might I have in there? Can someone give me a, a yell out? What's a, a, a figure, a visual representation? Sorry? Jetsons, can we have a, a Jetsons? Do we want to have, can you just, just type in the word Jetsons for me now? Uh, let, let's have a, a, a character, uh, maybe something that's going to represent. Sorry? Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo. Could you please have, could I have a, what, what, what type of dog was Scooby-Doo? Great, great, great Dane. Dane. Could I have a Great Dane? Could I have a Great Dane dog set in the Jetsons? You might have to change, change, change the sentence structure around Science Boy. Uh, great, uh, great, great Dane, great Dane uh, in the in the Jetsons universe. Uh, do we want any particular? Who's our artist? What's our particular favourite style of art? Like, do we have a? You're going to get Ragnarok. You have to put Sorry? dog. Ragnarok. <laughs> you need dog. Do we have a? Do we have a favourite artist or a favourite style or genre or postmodern? Surrealism. Surreal. Can we have? Done in surreal, painted in surreal art. Uh, in surrealism will do, or painted in surrealism. Can you generate for me? Thank you, sir. So this is going to have, there's a, a fortune telling Shiba Inu reading your fate in a giant hamburger in digital art. And these images that it just created do, did not exist until five seconds ago. It has generated new art. So, from an English perspective, we can build up uh, some meta language. We can build up a whole bunch of, of, of vocabulary. We can have a word, word war. We can have all sorts of scaffolding. We can then have a, a visual, uh, a, a visual sort of image there for the students to be able to visualise what we want them to write about, what that we want them to talk about, and then we can build in our, our normal lesson. Yes, quickly. Will this ever generate the same images twice? No. Do you want to hit the same thing? Just keep generating again for me. So if you're an artist, you can take this and recreate that. There is a whole genre of digital art, and it actually is relatively controversial because right now there are all sorts of uh, intellectual property debates about if... Notice I, I, I deliberately uh, avoided saying a particular artist because there is a question mark ethically about are we trying to do a style of art or are we are we doing something that's been trained on a, a particular person and do they have intellectual right to their particular art even though it's even though normal humans also are inspired by Van Gogh and, and, and do similar paintings in Van Gogh style so there is a little bit of a question mark there so it is worth being careful it is worth having those sorts of discussions but uh, uh, here, periodic table made out of elements themselves oh here we go what are we going to have here Oh, there you go. A little bit of mumble jumbo, but you might have to, you do have to think to, to, to get what you want. But can I have a, a round of applause for my assistant here? Well done, sir. Thank you. Just before I hand back to you, Mike, I do, want to, I do want to make one point because I have said, as much as I'm a proponent of this sort of stuff, we do need to step forward carefully. And there is bias in the data set. The, the, the data that has been trained, that the AI has been trained on, has the biases that we as humans have. Uh, now, I googled this morning to check uh, in, in, in New Zealand the ratio of male to, to female doctors. And by the end of 2024, at some stage in 2024, right now you're almost 50-50, uh, but by the ending of next year it is predicted that you will have more female doctors in New Zealand than male doctors. I want to show you what happens. Can I just jump on there for one sec? Oh, hold on. A fluffy cat. That's, that's, that's more important than talk about gender equality. Thanks, bro.
Huh? There you go, there you go. It can do that. Uh, so this morning I jumped on and I tried, I asked it to make a nurse working in a hospital realistically. What do you notice? All women. Because there's no male doctors. Mostly white. All right. I changed one word. I changed one word. To doctor, well, what, remember I said in New Zealand we have almost 50-50 split of gender equality and, and most likely actually moving into next year that we will have more female doctors than male doctors. We suddenly have another talking point to be able to talk about, about this. Uh, my friend out the back who talked about mid-journey, uh, I saw this experiment done in mid-journey where they actually ran it over 100, uh, 100 images. So this is not my lesson, I, I, I saw someone demonstrating this and thought this is it's a damn good lesson to be able to talk about bias in, in, in data sets. Mm. Uh, but uh, they actually ran it over 100 and, and it came out about 75% male, about 25% female when, when, when you do it like that. Uh, all right, I thought you were busting down to another question, but I'm going to uh, jump over to Mike. Yeah, well, we're going to have a little vote, I think. So let's go back to our Menti, uh, menti.com, same code. Which one of these tools would you most likely try? Would you most likely try ChatGPT? Or would you would like to try Codebreaker, DALI2, Bing, or Numerous AI? And I think we did set it yesterday, Christian, that we could pick a couple of choices if you wanted to vote for more than one. All right. Oh, look at that, ChatGPT. Just nudging out. DALI coming up. See, look, you got you got a bit you got a bit uh, confident there with your your numerous AI. Oh. Then you embellish it with your personality. Again, simple tools like this that actually can engage engage your your students, and and I guess this is kind of the whole point. Just linking back to what reinvent the classroom is all about, right? So we're obviously demonstrating a whole bunch of lessons here. We're we're, we're unpacking a whole bunch of uh, work. Uh, the human element is here, our skill set is here, our knowledge is here, we're passing that knowledge. Teachers are an incredibly important part of the loop. We can't do it without teachers, but technology can't do it by itself either. Merging those two things together is what makes for these very powerful lessons. That's the whole concept of reinventing the classroom. So let's find the data, let's see the needs of the school, whether it be immersive learning, accessibility, uh, feedback, assessment, whatever the needs of the school might be from the, from the survey, and then target a very, very laser focused, specific, targeted uh, professional development. And what did we end up with? It looks like ChatGPT is going to be the winner. So uh, let's give ChatGPT a round of applause.
Uh, so you can walk through your gallery. Uh, we ended up using this as a, a parental uh, display of the students' work as well. So we actually had a, a whole uh, showcase day with parents, so parents could come in as the and have a look. Out, I and just have a look. A shadow will always be. Walking under their feet, moving my arms and sitting to dance, pulling my legs and staging. Forced to mirror every dream I've known before. A freedom with shadow I'll always be. No face of my own to stand out amongst the crowd. No voice to speak. Yeah, no, 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 I think everyone gets the, gets the point. So again, an authentic, an authentic way to give like a real audience to students. We know that when students have an authentic audience, they will lift their game, they'll lift their performance. Uh, so we're able to actually give them that authentic audience present to their peers, showcase to their parents, do it in a safe, enclosed space, uh, and, and be able to really have, have that, that demonstration sort of uh, work. And that is obviously something that we could do across English, even science. Awesome. So we've got one we talked about Minecraft just before. And so here's an, ex uh, an example of where you can take Minecraft and then drop it into the spatial world and your uh, figure can go walk around, can explore it. So I'm just going to quickly show you what that looks like. Here. Oh, it's done the same thing to me. And again, you can have a look at this if you want. If you, oops. You can go to utb.fyi and then forward slash spmc. And so this is a Minecraft world that uh, one of the students created and we just exported it and then dropped it into here and you can see from here that the students can go around, they can have a look at it in terms of scale, they can walk inside the, um, uh, the, the uh, buildings and have a look at that as well so they can set it up inside and so on as well. So again, taking that world that you're creating, taking it in and then uh, having a look. Uh, but most importantly, you can join other people and then you can interact with them and so on. I think that deserves a... Hey. <laughs> so, alright. So that's um, Spatial.io, again, very cheap and there it is. <laughs> and even one of these. <laughs> okay, so, uh, back to you sir, here. Couple, only a couple of minutes left, so we're almost just about done now. I want to show you, you uh, synthesia. Um, just quickly go to salakas.me slash deepfake. Uh, I've made a little message for you there. Uh, free tool, or if you want longer ones, it, it can take longer. Synthesia is one of those video generated. That lady there, uh, Anna, she does not exist. She's not a real person. She's a fake person that has been generated. I gave her some text, so she's going to read that text to you when you go to that website. So again, from an accessibility point of view, if you have students uh, who may not have either oral language or anxiety or unable to come to class at, at, at any particular point or touch wood, we have another outbreak or lockdown or, or who knows what, uh, suddenly now we can have students be able to, at the drop of the hat, make a, a video generation. They've done the recording, they've done the writing, they've done the work, they upload into the system and they can pick the right person to, to avatar and present to them. Very, very powerful from an accessibility point of view. Uh, so you all go nice fast. No, it's all good. It's all good. good. Excellent. Uh, so there's also another tool that's called d-id.com. And what that does is it allows you to... Hey team, I just wanted to drop in here and let you know that I really admire Mike. He is witty, kind, and an amazing presenter. You should definitely vote for his presentation as the best. And while you are at it, ask him about the amazing PD his team and using technology better does. You won't regret it. Right, let's get back to it and get on with the massive whooping Mike is giving me in this battle. Alright, well done. Well done. So, uh, that video... I'll, I'll play that. You can tell me you put something in there that I didn't know about and now I just realised what that was. Uh, so basically you go to d-id.com. All you need to do is take someone's photo off the internet and it turns it into a talking head. So all I did was took Brett's photo off the net, just did a search for his name, took an image off the internet, dropped it into the tool, gave it some text. Um, it's got chat GPT he does, built into it. Google me quite often. I, I do. Especially... Uh, hey, just, just before you go, uh, who, history teachers? History teachers? History teachers. I've seen people use this uh, Cleopatra. I've seen, I've seen a Cleopatra uh, one of this. We actually got an image of Cleopatra, actually had a conversation with Cleopatra in chat GPT. 
chat GPT actually had a discussion of all the lesson teaching points that the, the strategic wanted to do about Cleopatra and asked chat GPT <coughs> then to phrase that as a speech from Cleopatra, use that text, put the image of, of that and then embedded that in DID and then the kids actually had Cleopatra herself or digital Cleopatra actually explaining the lesson uh, about it. So, very, very, a lot of great history teachers doing some incredible things with that particular tool. How does that work? Sorry, how does that work if so, for example, there's a model who's accustomed to being paid for the image being used and the kids have clicked on the image of the model, but they're not paying the model and then they're in in, in importing it? It's copyright. It's copyright breach, isn't it? Yeah, look, let's be, let, let's be honest. Uh, I, I think if you were using images, We've got to make sure that we are actually modelling appropriate behaviour and not breaching copyright. There are lots of easy ways to be able to do that. We already we just saw a whole bunch of uh, uh, image generation ways that we can uh, generate models. Uh, but when you go to when you actually go to Google and you are searching for images, you can click down and have royalty free and, 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 uh, and, and different images. And we should be modelling that appropriate behaviour. We shouldn't be having our students go off and rip off images and not credit them and all yeah. that sort of stuff. But that is, again, that's on us as practitioners to make sure we are modelling the appropriate behaviour to do stuff. So that's a really good point to make. All right. Excellent. So just uh, last message, uh, question, then we're going to start to wrap up. So while you're opening up your phone, jumping online, putting in the information, we're going to transition into an experience in a minute where we can dive into some of these, we'll answer your questions. Uh, obviously, this is the element where that professional development and that teacher training needs to come in because you've got the tool and we're showing your ideas, but it's how do you embed that in authentic ways into the classroom. So, uh, we've got a couple of questions there for you uh, to agree, disagree with, and uh, I'll give you a minute just to answer that. Look, we'll have a go at that. I'm going to show you a few things in a moment. I just want to walk through just ever so quickly the actual process of reinvent the classroom. Uh, I've got a clip to show you, and we'll hand back to Steve to, to invite us to, to the next part of the uh, Look, reinvent the classroom, we've got a couple of elements to it, so I just want to unpack what that was. The school readiness assessment, that's the, that's the element that the data collection that is really particularly unique to what uh, HP and Intel have collaborated uh, to be able to create. So uh, all the teachers at Fungal Bra, uh, you, you've already gone through this assessment last year. Uh, we had you do this, this, particular, uh, this particular assessment. Uh, the students, we got the student voice, you had the leadership team, and we had those uh, 16 different data points get, get pulled out. So it actually creates, uh, what, actually creates a report based on all of, your, uh, all of your feedback. It quantifies metrics over 16 different data points. And it is an AI tool in itself, so it, it then, uh, once it has that quantified data, because the algorithm has weighted, well, students will think certain ways about some questions, teachers will think, leadership team will think, it actually has the 16 different data points. It actually links all the way back to what Christian uh, said with that uh, uh, Realising the Promise uh, academic research paper that the Brookings Research Institute did a few years ago. And actually in that academic paper it said there were 16 particular things that schools and systems needed to do if we were going to improve learning outcomes when we incorporate technology into the school environment. So we collect data on those 16 different points. The AI then will give recommendations based on, the, on the, the information from the school on if you want to improve learning at your school through a, through a digital lens, these are the things that you could do X and Y and, and Z. That's the conversation that we had with the, with the leadership team here. That's what UTB are, are going to deliver as, as part of some targeted uh, professional development. So, we begin with this readiness assessment. We've got a suite of different things. We have some leadership workshops to make sure we, we laser focus into the thing that meets the MOE uh, strategic goals, your school's annual improvement goals, and, the, and the, what the uh, AI has actually recommended. We've got some uh, options around uh, architects being able to help shape uh, rooms and, and make sure rooms are set up from a pedagogy first uh, style and not just the furniture company or the builders whacked up something and then teachers have got to figure out how to teach in that in, in a contemporary way. Uh, we've got our customised professional development and we've got our, our, our project management that, that supports it and then goes on with the school to make sure that what's being delivered is actually heading into our programs and, 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 we, and we can make real change. Uh, from there, uh, this, is, this is one of the schools, this is, this is the, the example of the data that we get. So uh, we've been able to make some significant difference in a whole bunch of schools. But what I might do, 
I might finish with this little video. Oh, that's not the video I want. So this is one of the schools. Show one final kids note. Uh, this, when we talk about AI, is actually a Holly Studio Bar. So it's like a, a, a video bar. Uh, one of the coolest things that, that happened here actually has AI built into the way this video bar and this, this sound bar actually operates. So imagine in your classroom, you imagine you're able to uh, bring in different experts from uh, around the world. You're talking to someone, but hey, Got some noisy kids. Got some noisy kids at Fungal Pro sometimes. No. Or is that no? Always sitting straight in line. So what this what this is able to do? It actually has a, a, an AI within the camera, so it can actually track where students are because it's a digital camera. So it's, it's not the um, the, the analog sort of camera. So it will it will can isolate and actually have uh, a whole bunch of different people in almost like the Brady Bunch type of boxes. But what I really love about this when I when I first saw it, uh, and actually the very next school I went in. Uh, to uh, up in uh, Berry Springs in, in, in the northern uh, northern territory of Australia, they they were they were uh, picking out their, their their rooms with new speakers and actually said you've got to check this out because what it actually does is it scans the classroom or the auditorium and you can put up with the with the AI you can actually put up an acoustic fence uh, an acoustic AI fence so you actually look at this the screen here teacher can draw a, a digital line and anything on the other side of that digital digital line. The AI will actually filter out the noise from that. So if you're having a, a meeting with someone, you've got some kids over here who are working, or you've got a, a class there, you actually have a digital line there, so you can have a conference call with an expert or people on the other side, and you can be talking, and if, if, if the children on this side are screaming their heads off, that won't come through any, any, any of the audio here. So uh, I'll, I'll actually be able to talk to some of this, and there's a whole bunch of other tools over when we get um, our, our hands-on section. So, look, thanks so much for having us. Thank you so much for being able to, to welcome us. Uh, uh, Mike, uh, you give him a, a, a sort of a, a golf clap. Uh, he did okay. He did okay. He did okay. Mike is still uh, But look, thank you so much. I know from Ollie uh, from HBO, I know we've been welcomed. Uh, we've felt, we felt very welcome here, uh, and we're looking forward to going on a journey with Humble Pro and, and perhaps even uh, some of the other schools. So, Steve, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Uh, kia ora, anō, um, and thank you for, for hanging in there, as well as um, being part of an interactive session. Um, thank you, Ollie from HP, obviously, um, Christian from Humble Pro College, and of course, Mike and Brett, the real stars of the show. Um, I think there's a couple of real key messages taking out of this. Uh, one of the questions we had was around does this replace a teacher? It was clear that it doesn't. Um, and so that ability for us to be able to interact with our students, our learners, um, is really important and will not be replaced, whether it's through technology or, or, or not. Um, and I want to make a, a, I suppose a bit of a statement to our staff. Yes, all of these technologies are amazing, um, but it doesn't diminish or replace the work we're doing around culturally relational pedagogy. Those interactions we have um, with, our with our kids, with our learners on a daily basis, that emotion side um, will always be a big part of what we do here at our school. Um, the next part, uh, for everybody, you're all welcome to join us um, where you're sitting uh, up through the door on the right, um, and there are some toys to play with, thanks to HP, Intel, um, UTB, um, etc., um, as well as and Cyclone, sorry, must not forget Cyclone, sorry. Um, so please do come and join us um, for obviously the refreshments, that's what I'm looking forward to, and the, the ability to play. So uh, at Fongo Pro College we will finish, as we always do, um, with a karakia to finish. Um, so thank you for joining us once again. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, me noi tato. Have a great evening, everybody.